All right. So last time, apparently, we talked about food chains. Okay. Um, and so we talked about food chains and how you have like we how we trace matter and energy from one um, animal to the next, and how when we draw the arrows, right, we draw the arrow from what's doing or being eaten to what's doing the eating, right? And when we trace matter and energy, um, what we tra we're tracing is um, tells us about who's eating who and um, the the role in the ecosystem. So it tells us their role in the ecosystem, it tells us their value, and then it also tells us if the ecosystem is able to be sustained and supported. Um, and so we trace matter and energy so we know a little bit about what animals' behaviors are, why, who they're competing with, why they're doing that, um, what they're trying to avoid being eaten by. All right? So we looked at food chains, okay, because that's actually how we trace matter and energy. Um, and in a food chain, each step in the food chain is called a trophic level, okay, a trophic level. So basically just a trophic level is an energy storing step, okay, and we use them to compare different food chains. But here's a couple different food chains. So this corn right here, this would be a trophic level. It stores matter and energy until it gets eaten by the chicken. And then the chicken stores matter and energy until it gets eaten by the person in KFC. Okay, so each of these is a trophic level, stores matter and energy. So we use trophic levels so that we can compare different food chains and compare the roles of different organisms in different ecosystems and see who's fulfilling the same kinds of roles. Does that make sense? Okay, so we can compare our land food chain to our ocean food chain with the kelp, the urchin, and the sea otter and see, okay, in these two food chains, the person and the sea otter are serving like the same role. Yeah? Okay, so because scientists like to name things, we name all of our trophic levels, okay? And so um, the lowest trophic level, the things that we've been calling autotrophs that make their own food, we call them primary producers, okay? Primary producers, so they make their own food. Examples of autotrophs, primary producers in the ocean are going to be things like bacteria and diatoms. Okay, um, and algae, so like seaweeds, and also some plants. So you've got like marsh plants and actually sea grasses themselves. So you've got different kinds of primary producers. And you guys looked at diatoms under the microscope in your lab, right? So diatoms are little single-celled plants. They start off food chains in the ocean. Yeah? Okay. So those are our primary producers. They're the autotrophs that start off all the food chains. Herbivores, okay, we call primary consumers. So you have primary producers and then you have primary consumers. These are the things that are going to be eating um, the primary producers. They like salad, okay? So they eat all of the primary producers um, and that's all that they eat. So manatees just eat seagrass. Here's our little picture of our manatee, bless you, eating seagrass, okay? Um, our sea turtle eating turtle grass urchin eating kelp, okay, they're eating the prim primary producers. So primary consumer, primary first consumer, so they're the first consumers, all right? So the first things that are eating the primary producers. On the bottom right picture right here, that's a copepod. Copepods are going to be the little animals in the ocean that actually eat like the diatoms and the little teeny tiny phytoplankton. So you have tons and tons of copepods in the ocean and you guys saw those again in your lab as well, right? Um, so there's lots of these little copepods eating the little teeny tiny phytoplankton, all right? And then they get eaten by bigger things, and so they're actually an important link in the food chain to pass energy and matter up from the tiny microscopic plankton to higher levels of the food chain. Okay, so copepods are also herbivores. Carnivores are going to be like secondary consumers or top consumers. So they're going to be things that are eating the other animals. Okay, so they're the second consumer. You can have different levels as you go up the food chain. So you could have like tertiary and quaternary consumers. Tertiary would be like the third step um, and then the quaternary would be like the fourth consumer. So um, but they would all be carnivores. So they are carnivores. They hunt and kill other animals. Examples, 
to be like sea otters, most sharks, sea stars. Most sharks, not all sharks. So, and here's your pictures. So sea otters eating urchins, okay? Sharks eating like your seal, and like tuna eating other fish, and sea stars eating mussels, and then anemones eat fish and other animals as well. All right? Okay. Omnivores can be um, either a primary or a secondary consumer depending on what they are eating. So omnivores will eat both plants and animals. And if they are eating plants, okay, then they are going to be the primary consumer. Um, if they're eating the animals, then they're going to be a secondary consumer. So it just depends on what they're eating at the time. That will determine what they, um, what step in the food chain they are. So examples, mussels, anchovies, and clams. So these mussels right here in the top left, um, when it's high tide, okay, the water comes up and covers these mussels. They open their shells and they stick their feeding apparatus out and they will feed on both phytoplankton, which are plants, and the zooplankton that are in the water. So if they're eating the phytoplankton, they'll be primary consumers, but if they're eating the zooplankton, they will be secondary consumers. All right, you also have detritivores. Detritivores are going to be scavengers. They're going to be the things that are eating other um, things that have died. Okay, so they eat dead stuff. Um, the term detritus is the term that we will use for the rest of the year for, detrit for dead stuff. Okay, so if you hear the term detritus, it means dead stuff. And you will literally hear it for the rest of the year. So make sure you know it now. Save yourself some trouble. All right, so detritus, dead stuff. And lots of carnivores that would like normally go around and hunt and kill things, if the opportunity presents itself and there's something dead, they'll eat that too. So they'll be a carnivore, but then if they have to be, if it's easy food, then they'll be a scavenger, okay, a detritivore. So they'll eat dead stuff. Um, some examples are going to be things like worms, okay, eating the dead stuff out of the dirt, um, crabs, are detritivores, so they'll hunt and prey and kill things, but then if there's something that dies, they'll eat that too. Um, and then hagfish, we'll talk about hagfish when we talk about the deep sea, but um, hagfish, if, when a whale dies and it falls to the bottom, hagfish are one of the main things that actually eat the dead whale. So, and we'll actually watch a movie about that too. So those are examples of detritivores, scavengers, they eat dead stuff. Decomposers are going to be different from your detritivores. So detritivores are going to eat the dead stuff. Your decomposers are um, going to actually break that dead stuff down and return it into the ecosystem in the form of nutrients. Okay, so decomposers eat waste products like poop okay, and decaying things, and they break them down so and help to recycle those nutrients into the ecosystem. Most of the time, your decomposers are going to be bacteria. Little single-celled microorganisms that live in the water. All right. So, bacteria, decomposers. And we skipped the slide that we're now going to go back to right now. I know. We'll get there. Okay, so we skip this slide. So we're talking about transferring matter and energy through an ecosystem, and that matter and energy gets transferred through the different trophic levels, okay? Um, but okay, matter and energy will go through an ecosystem differently, okay? So matter, which is the actual like, physical atoms that the, you are made of, so when, you're, when you eat your food, Okay, the actual physical atoms that that food is made of, um, that matter gets cycled through an ecosystem. It gets reused. Okay, matter is neither created nor destroyed, so it gets reused. Energy, on the other hand, um, only goes one way through an ecosystem. All right, so here's how that happens. So you have the sun okay, giving energy to all of your primary producers, okay, and so the primary producers have matter and energy. They get eaten okay, by consumers over here. Okay, and those consumers pass it up the food chain. So you have primary, secondary, tertiary consumers pass it up the food chain. 
Okay, and so the matter and energy goes through um, those levels of the food chain. When the primary producers or the consumers die, decomposers break them down. Okay, and so the decomposers will get like the last vestiges of energy out of whatever has died, and then the matter gets put back into the nutrient pool, and then those can be reused by the primary producers. Okay, so energy only goes one way through the ecosystem, whereas matter gets recycled. Does that make sense? Energy only goes one way, okay, and the matter gets recycled. That's why we need a perpetual input of energy into our ecosystem, okay? And the reason why um, energy only goes one way is because at each level in the food chain, each trophic level, you lose energy, okay? So only about 10% of the energy from one trophic level to the next is passed on. And there's three major reasons why only 10% gets passed on. Um, number one is inedible materials. So when you eat a clam, okay, you eat like the soft body of the clam, right? But you still have the shell of the clam, okay? The clam put a lot of energy from the food that it ate into making that shell. However, you can't eat the shell and like digest the shell and get the energy from that shell, right? So when you eat that clam, that energy that's stored in that, in that shell is lost to you, right? So inedible materials like bones and shells and stuff, the energy that's in there you can't get. So that gets lost. Also, um, when that clam ate its food, it took some of the energy that it got from that food and put it into its own cellular functioning and growth, okay? So it burned that energy um, and used it. And so now it's gone. So now when you eat that clam, you can't get that energy, all right? Because they already used it, it's gone. Also, reproductive losses. So when that clam reproduces, it will release either eggs or sperm into the water, and it takes energy to make those eggs or sperm, okay? And so the energy that it used to make those is now lost to you as well. Does that make sense? So only 10% of the energy from one level to the next can be passed on because of these reasons. So energy gets lost at each step in the food chain, so you need a perpetual input of energy into the ecosystem to keep it going. Yay, sun. Yeah? Okay. So here's a picture that you actually have in your notes to help you see this. So if you have 100% of energy available in your primary producers, um, when the herbivores eat that, only 10% of that gets passed on. 90% is lost because of inedible materials, cellular functioning, and reproduction. When a carnivore eats that herbivore, only 1% gets passed on of the original energy, okay? And then if another carnivore eats that carnivore, only 0.1% gets passed on, right? So eventually, um, this is why we don't have like infinite number, like amounts of uh, animals in a food chain. Food chains only really have five to six levels at the most because you lose energy at each step. And so if you have like one top carnivore, it's gonna take like one top carnivore takes 10 uh, lower level carnivores to support it. And then those 10 lower level carnivores are gonna need 100 um, herbivores to support it. And those 100 herbivores are gonna need 1,000 primary producers to support it. Does that make sense? So there's only so many primary producers, so you can only have so many top carnivores. So you lose energy. Yay? Good, understand? All right, now we get to talk about plankton, <laughs> okay? Um, so, plankton, you can read the quote from Rachel Carson that's up here, but basically, plankton means wanderer. They're the wanderers of the ocean. So you can see these different pictures of plankton, okay? Um, here's, you know, plankton from SpongeBob. It's gonna take over the world. Um, and then a couple pictures of actual plankton, real plankton, all right? Plankton is not real. Not SpongeBob plankton, at least. Um, okay, so plankton. When people think of plankton, they have some serious misconceptions about what plankton are. Um, typically, people think that plankton are teeny tiny little animals that get eaten by whales. Okay. Um, while that's true, that is a very, very narrow view of plankton. They're, plankton are so much more than that. Okay. Um, the reality is that plankton are both plants and animals. So you have plants and animals that are plankton. 
Um, and you have three characteristics that you have to have in order to be considered to be a plankton. Number one, you have to be alive. Okay, so in our definition or qualification of being alive, bless you, um, it's you have to do respiration and reproduction, right? So you have to be alive. Um, otherwise, you're dead, and you're called detritus now. You're dead stuff. Um, you have to be alive, and you have to drift, okay? Um, which means, or you can swim weakly. But basically, the whole idea behind this is if you get caught in a current, there's no way that you can swim against the current. So you can't fight against it and go your own direction. You get carried with the current wherever you go. Okay? So you're alive, you drift, and then you float. Okay? Floating typically means for us, like at the surface, so you float up near the surface. Um, but you can also float at a depth. Okay? So you have plankton that float like deeper in the ocean. All right? So they're just kind of like chilling, hanging out deeper in the ocean, and if, a, if there's a current, it goes with the current. All right? Alive drift float. Those are the only three qualifications that you need to have in order to be considered a plankton. Do you see anything about the size of plankton up here? This is a plankton. This is the largest jellyfish in the ocean. This is the Arctic lion's mane jelly. You can see the picture, like the comparison of, between that jellyfish and the person, yeah? See that? That's a plankton. It's alive. It can swim weakly, but if it gets caught in a current, it's going with the current. So it drifts and it floats. So it's plankton, okay? This is a 450 pound jelly with a six foot across bell. And it's plankton, yeah. So, plankton, doesn't matter what size, as long as the live or drifts or floats, it w and floats, it will be plankton, okay? So, Arctic wine's main jelly, the largest that they've ever found, it was an eight foot across bell, so the bell was eight feet across, and its tentacles were 120 feet long. So, longer than a blue whale were its tentacles. It's huge. Okay, so we take our plankton, and we group it into two groups based on its um, nutrition. So how does it get its energy? So you have phytoplankton, which are plants that live in the ocean, and then you have zooplankton, which are animals, because you go to the zoo to see animals, right? So zooplankton. Um, so phytoplankton, plants, zooplankton, animals. Characteristics of phytoplankton. They are autotrophs, primary producers, do photosynthesis, make their own food, okay? Plants. So their source of energy comes from the sunlight, to do, and they do photosynthesis. Um, they're going to need things like carbon dioxide and water, as well as nitrogen and phosphorus in order to be able to do that, okay, to do photosynthesis. And then you can see your little review of photosynthesis right there. So they take carbon dioxide and water to make glucose, sugar, energy, and oxygen. All right? Okay. Um, in order for phytoplankton to be able to do photosynthesis, they have to have certain pigments that allow for them to capture the sunlight, the energy from the sunlight, to drive that photosynthetic reaction. So they have pigments to gather light for photosynthesis. Um, they're, phytoplankton are a little bit different from land plants, though. So land plants, when you look at a plant, um, you'll see, like, the leaves are the part of the plant that's green, right? So Chlorophyll, which is the main light collector for photosynthesis, has looks green. Okay, so in land plants, that chlorophyll only occurs in the leaves. Okay, so only the leaves on land plants can do photosynthesis. Whereas, like um, in phytoplankton and also in seaweed and algae, um, that chlorophyll is located throughout the entire thing. So the entire body of that phytoplankton or algae can do photosynthesis. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, where it is on the on the plant, it will do it. So only on the leaves and land plants, all throughout, in phytoplankton and algae. So chlorophyll is the main light collector, but you'll also have accessory pigments that will collect different wavelengths of light um, in order to help them to do photosynthesis. Um, and the main reason for that, um, to have accessory pigments, is to reduce competition for light, and I will explain what that is in just a second. Okay, but the point is to uh, 
reflect and reduce competition for light. All right. Here's how this works. Um, you guys remember back to like seventh grade science, the visible spectrum, Roy G. Biv. Okay. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Yeah. Okay. So uh, visible light. That those are the wavelengths of light that are going to be used for photosynthesis. Okay. That's what the plants collect in order to do photosynthesis. Um, different wavelengths of light will actually penetrate to different depths in the water. Okay. Because water absorbs light. Okay. So uh, red light. Okay. So here's our red light right here. Okay. Um, it gets absorbed first. So it only goes, you know, a few feet into the water before the water has absorbed all wavelengths of red light. Okay. Um, blue penetrates the deepest. That's why the ocean looks blue, because the blue is able to go the deepest into the water. So the blue is the last to be filtered out, to be absorbed. Um, so if you have a pigment that can absorb um, blue light, you can live deeper in the water than you can if you have a pigment that absorbs red light, right? If you have a pigment that absorbs red light, you have to live up here near the surface where there's red light. But if you have a pigment that absorbs blue light, you can live deeper, which means that different phytoplankton can live at different depths and they reduce their competition for sunlight. Does that make sense? Okay. So it helps to absorb light for photosynthesis. Okay. So this picture that you're seeing right now, this is a pigment absorption spectrum. So this is a picture um, that represents which colors of light uh, a pigment is absorbing to use for photosynthesis and which it is reflecting or not using. Okay, so when you see something, um, so like when I see uh, Harrison's green sweatshirt right now, okay, uh, what's happening is the dye that's in his sweatshirt is absorbing all of the colors of light except for green. And then it reflects the green back to my eyes and my eyes pick up the color green. Okay, so his pigment and his, his dye in his sweatshirt is absorbing all of those colors of light other than green. All right, the pigments that do photosynthesis do the same thing as well. So chlorophyll, okay, which is the pigment that all things that do photosynthesis have, it absorbs all colors of light except for green. It reflects the green back and that's why plants look green. Okay, so um, here's our little picture here. Um, here you have the wavelengths, the colors of light at the bottom, okay, and then the amount of them that is absorbed up the side. Okay, and so you've got two different types of chlorophyll, okay, which are represented by two different lines here. Um, so let's look at chlorophyll A, okay, the dark green line. So the high points on the graph, okay, represent um, that that color of light is being absorbed. So chlorophyll A is absorbing like the blue and the purple range, right? The low points represent the colors that are being reflected, or these are the colors that are not being used for photosynthesis, the ones that you see, okay? And then if you keep following the line, so it reflects like green and some yellow, and then it absorbs the red and the orange. Do you see that? Okay, so those, chlorophyll A is using those colors of light for photosynthesis and reflecting the green, which is why it looks green. Chlorophyll B, pretty much the same. See that? Carotenoids, which is the yellow line right here, that is an accessory pigment, okay, another pigment that can be used to help to capture light. Notice what colors it's absorbing. It's absorbing lots of the purple okay, and lots of the blue, but it's reflecting like a lot, and it absorbs some green too, but it's reflecting like the yellow and red and orange. See that? So when in the fall, when trees start to lose their leaves, right, um, and the trees change colors, What's happening is that plants are, the trees stop producing chlorophyll, um, and so the chlorophyll disappears, and what you see are the accessory pigments coming through. They look yellow and red, right? Because they're absorbing the other colors of light and reflecting the yellow and the red. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so here's your notes for this. So the color that is used for photosynthesis is the color that's absorbed. Those are going to be the high points on the graph. Okay, the chlorophyll and the chlorophylls will use blue and red. Okay, and the carotenoids use the blue. Um, and then the colors that you see, those are the ones that are reflected. Those are the low points. 
Okay, chlorophylls reflect green and the carotenoids reflect yellow, orange, and red. So that's why like, I noticed driving home yesterday that some of the leaves are starting to change and they're starting to turn yellow and red and stuff. Chlorophyll's leaving and you're seeing the accessory pigments. All right. Okay, so phytoplankton. Why do we even care about phytoplankton? Well, here's like the two major reasons why phytoplankton are actually important. And you're actually alive right now because of them. Um, two reasons. Number one. Most of the food chains in the ocean occur and start with phytoplankton. So without phytoplankton, life in the ocean doesn't exist. Number two, most of the oxygen that you're breathing right now is because of phytoplankton. Yeah, 70% of the oxygen that you breathe comes from phytoplankton. You're like, wait, hey, the rainforest, right? Rainforests are what give us all our oxygen. And yes, we should save the rainforest, but here's why we actually get more oxygen from our phytoplankton than from our trees and plants on land. So uh, phyto or you produce oxygen when you do photosynthesis, right? That's one of the byproducts. Uh, and plants only have chlorophyll, which does photosynthesis in their leaves. So in a deciduous forest, okay, during the spring and the summer, when the trees have their leaves, they can do photosynthesis and produce oxygen, right? But in the fall and the winter, when they lose their leaves, are they doing photosynthesis then? No, which means that they're not producing oxygen during the winter, okay? Whereas in a like an evergreen forest, coniferous forest, um, they don't lose their leaves, okay, during the winter because they're the, like the little pine needles, okay? But they get covered with snow, so some of the sunlight gets blocked and um, the sunlight is less intense. So they're going to be doing less photosynthesis. So that means that they're, they produce less oxygen. Here's what the difference between spring and winter looks like in the ocean. Is there any difference? Phytoplankton do photosynthesis year round. Also 70% of the earth, 71% of the earth is covered by the oceans. So it makes up the most of the surface of the earth and it can do photosynthesis year round eight for 70 percent of your oxygen. All right, make sense? All right, so phytoplankton grow. So they have to grow, they have to reproduce, um, and in order for them to be able to do that, they need these things that we call limiting resources. Okay, and limiting resources, those are anything that when they are in short supply, they limit the growth of the phytoplankton. So they are limiting resources. Okay, So anything when it's in short supply limits the growth of the phytoplankton. Phytoplankton have two limiting resources, light and nutrients. Those are the two things that they must absolutely have. If they don't have either of those things, they cannot grow. So they need light and nutrients. Light is found in the photic zone. That's the top 200 meters of water. Okay, so you find light in the top layer of water. Below those 200 meters, you're going to have the aphotic zone. That's where there is not enough light for photosynthesis. That makes up the majority of the ocean. Okay, so aphotic zone. The depth of the photic zone will change depending on the day and the conditions in the ocean. Okay, uh, so uh, we say 200 meters, okay, but in reality, that's gonna be a little bit different depending on A, where you are, and some of these factors. So particulate matter like dirt and phytoplankton in the water actually absorb the sunlight or, re or like dirt can reflect it back, um, which prevents the light from going as deep into the water. So those kinds of things can reduce the depth of the, of the photic zone. Um, also seasonal strength of the, of the sunlight. So during the winter, when there's not as much sunlight, Okay, we have less sunlight throughout the day and the sun doesn't even go as high into the sky. Um, you have less of a photic zone than you do in the summer. The weather can also change it. 
So on a sunny day like today, okay, this photic sun will be deeper in the water than it would be on a cloudy day. Does that make sense? All right. Last one. So here's just a reminder, different wavelengths of light penetrating different depths into the water. Okay, the other limiting resource that they need are nutrients. So light and nutrients. They need nutrients as fertilizer in order to grow and like do photosynthesis. They also need things like, uh, so nitrogen and phosphorus to grow. They also need things like iron in order to do photosynthesis and other things like silica and calcium. Nutrients are located mostly in the deep sea, below the thermocline, past 200 meters in the water. Um, and the reason for that is the thermocline acts like a barrier and traps nutrients in the deep sea. Um, and when things die in the ocean, where all of the nutrients are located in dead things, when they die, they sink down to the bottom. Okay? They decay, nutrients get returned back into the water, but the thermocline acts as a barrier and keeps it down. All right. So phytoplankton are in a little bit of a conundrum. They need light and nutrients. The light's located at the top of the water. The nutrients are located in the deep. What is a poor phytoplankton to do? Because they need both. Well, the way that they actually deal with this is um, they live in places where you get upwelling okay, or places where the thermocline breaks down for some reason. So when the thermocline breaks down, that allows the nutrient-rich deep water to come up. So phytoplankton live at the surface where now you have sunlight and nutrients. So you can have lots of phytoplankton growth. Does that make sense? So here's just a picture to help you see the location of nutrients. The green line across the top, that's the thermocline. So lots of nutrients underneath there, less up at the top. Okay, so you need mixing in order to break down the thermocline and bring those nutrients up. All right, but we're going to stop there today.